Hi, I'm Evgenia Grinblow from episodes 138 and 139. And my joke is, when does a joke become a dad joke? When it becomes a parent. UX Podcast episode 300. You're listening to UX Podcast, coming to you from Stockholm, Sweden. Helping the UX community explore ideas and share knowledge for 300 episodes. We are your hosts, James Royal Lawson. And Pat Axbom. With listeners in countries and territories all over the world, from Great Britain to Tanzania. And we couldn't do the country you wanted, James. You, I know you wanted no, to do Liberia. I did. And, and, our, and you know, sometimes, sometimes these country choices at the beginning we have actually put thought into it and there is like an underlying secret theme of why they're there. But there are always countries that we have found in the stats. Yeah. And I wanted to do Great Britain to um, Liberia. Yeah, because I'm born in Liberia. But the stats show we, Great Britain. we haven't had any, had any listeners in Liberia across this time span of 11 and a half years. Uh, and I had to just look at it shortly, uh, and it turns out the internet penetration in Liberia is about 19%. But no, mm. not only that, the the 20% of the lowest earners in, in Liberia, they have to pay about 50% of their monthly salary salary for one gigabyte of data. So you mm. start to understand why it's it's uh, you don't have a lot of internet users there. Right. And if you if you do look at the countries that were missing from the list of countries where we've, where we've had listeners, and there aren't a huge number of them, mm. um, it's a, it's unfortunately a cluster of countries in Central Africa. Yep. And that that would be interesting in itself to to actually explore some more uh, about what that means uh, for them as a society and community. Today, though, yep. for our episode three hundred, three hundred. 300. Um, we are going to get all humorous. Yep. Back uh, at some point, I know you know which episode, we started having jokes on the show. And Jenny, who episode, did the first... Yeah. Sorry, episode... Episode 138. Right. And Jenny, who did the joke at the beginning, at the top of this episode, she was the one who actually asked us, well, shouldn't you do jokes at the end of your shows? And we started doing them. And we haven't stopped. And the reason why we started doing them was not just because um, well, Jenny suggested we did, it was because we've been joking and, and, well, complaining, I guess, about the, the dead zone that is the end of a podcast episode. Yeah, People exactly. don't listen to the end. As soon as you start saying, well, you know, recommended listening or you, know, you, you have your catchphrase, something triggers people at the end to go, ah, next episode. But and now we've learned that a lot of people, I I don't know how many, but a lot of people, it seems because they actually get back to us, which means that there is an impact. They do listen and they comment on the fact that we do have episodes with jokes because probably because they listen to several and then you have to you listen through the to the next one. You you hear the joke, of course. You mean you're saying it's all down to water play, not down to the jokes? I think so because they're not high quality jokes, and that's the thing, isn't it? It's it's, it's some of the worst jokes ever. That we do at the end of the shows, dad jokes. They as, are, as they call they are terrible. Yeah. Dad jokes, yes, mm -hmm. or yeah. Some we. I thought we started off with knock knock jokes. Yes, we. Yeah, that's we, right. Yeah. But what was the first joke, Pat? It Ooh, wasn't a knock knock joke. The first joke was a knock knock joke. Yes, I, I can do it for you. Knock knock. Who's there? A really bad visual designer. A really bad vis visual designer who? Listen, do we really need the, the knock knock? Can we move line two, three pixels to the right? And I thought we agreed on Helvetica. This is Ariel. That is really terrible, that one. That was a really bad joke. I don't know. Who oh. would understand that joke even? Well, who would understand it and then who would actually <laughs> laugh at it? <laughs> I'm laughing at it now. No, no, it's terrible. <laughs> For all the wrong reasons, of course. <laughs> and that's okay, too. Yeah. But um, today, though, um, we are going to bring you a few jokes, but we're also um, going to bring you an interview. 
Delia Chiara is a professor um, in the translation and interpretation department at the University of Bolgon- Bologna in Italy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you, f- you found her online when we re- wa- realized we wanted to do something about humor and jokes. And her main re- research interests are audiovisual translation and humor and intercultural communication, which is interesting uh, given the fact that we are such an international show. And she's also she's written an, oh, she's written books about um, humor, um, and quite recently even a book about um, humor in the digital age. Yes, exactly. And I think we wanted to do this because it's episode three hundred, and we did wanted to do something different. But as we are talking to Delia, I think we also realized this has a lot to do with UX and design and communication, doesn't it all? <laughs> I think we're going to start with the the big question, um, and and that is, um, what? Well, what is uh, a joke? <laughs> <laughs> we, we've been we discussing this a bit beforehand, and, and we we realised that I mean, all the th- all the other questions we had kind of seemed to back or boil down to that we needed to define it or at least explain what a joke is to be able to move on to some of the other questions. Um, it's a very very good question, but a joke is a linguistic trope, the aim of which is to amuse, and there are different categories of jokes, but jokes are independent entity entities. Um, verbally expressed humour is a larger entity in which you find the joke, because jokes are not the only way to be funny verbally. Right. Yeah. You've, you've got asides, you've got quips uh, within conversation, in banter. In The concept of banter is not couched within the joke form. Mm. Um, and I think today uh, we are witnessing the demise of the joke because people don't tell jokes anymore. Uh, When was the last time somebody told you a joke? If you think about it, when was the last time somebody actually told you a joke? It's much more likely that something came in on your mobile device and you saw, for example, a meme or you saw a TikTok reel. It's unlikely uh, that somebody's told you a joke. And even stand-up comedians don't tell jokes anymore. The days of Tommy Trinder and um, Tommy Cooper, pardon, are gone. Um, stand-up comedians don't tell jokes. They tell stories with quips within them rather than uh, how many women does it take, how many feminists does it take to uh, change a light bulb. So I would argue that, 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 that we saw the, the last jokes we really saw were probably in the 1990s, but I have absolutely no proof of that whatsoever. Um, because, uh, I don't know, 1990s, the 2000s, after 9-11, for example, um, jokes were still being told, and that was probably the the, the disaster jokes. After any disaster, you're going to get a a bunch of jokes. The Mm. Queen died recently, and there was a bunch of jokes coming up, but they weren't Mm. jokes today. They were memes um, rather rather than jokes. But with 9-11... Um, there were some jokes, but I do remember uh, sitting at my computer and helping um, uh, Christy Davis, uh, who is no longer with us, but the master of uh, the history of jokes. And he wasn't he, he wasn't good at computers, being of a certain age. And I remember sitting at the computer, and he was saying to Delia, "Tell me when the first nine eleven joke comes in on the internet." And I did. Hey, it's Mike White from Michigan. I'm a regular publishing volunteer, and I've got a cheesy joke for you. What's the best type of cheese for luring a bear out of a tree? Come on, bear. We finish every single podcast off with a, a joke, and we have done since um, September 2016. And and we you know we we've, we've been talking about well, what makes these bad jokes um, at the end of the show popular because we do get feedback that you no know, they're really good and really fun and so in part you've, you've I think you might have answered that or give some shed some light on it in that there it's a scarcity so the fact that we do yeah. say um, yeah. I guess traditional jokes if I mean now I'm, I'm kind of defining something as traditional without even really knowing how I what I mean by that but you know we've we started off 
Am yeah. I doing knock knock jokes? Yeah. Um, which I guess are a tra- traditional joke format. Um, they and are. you know we've done we've now done well. It was one hundred and thirty eight was the episode number that we um, uh, we did our first joke, and we're now on episode three hundred. So you can you can do the maths and work out we've done quite a few. Um, well, d- bad jokes, dad jokes, puns, um, mm. and I I wonder. Do we what 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 to, for our audience? Why do they find that so kind of um, amusing or comforting or or um, a thing uh, that they like um, and want us to keep at the end of the show? Well, certainly, comforting is a great word, and you're right that there are dozens of categories of jokes: uh, the knock knock joke, uh, the riddle, the uh, the pun. Remember that puns are not necessarily funny, though. Um, they can be, but but they're certainly clever. Puns are like detective novels, aren't they? You have to kind of work them out. Mm. There's some puns that you think are not funny, but but you do have that kind of sensation of um, aren't I clever? I've worked it out. Mm. Um, but they're certainly comforting. And, and I something that I left out before in your last question: if you go onto the internet, there are millions of hits for joke collections. Right, yes. uh, there are millions of hits, <laughs> hundreds, you know, lots of zeros. Um, and you have collection of jokes uh, online. So jokes do exist. But whether we tell them or not. So I think maybe what you said there about comfort, might, you might have something there. Uh, and of course, uh, of course, we want to be comforted. It's a bit like a warm cup of tea or... Um, mm. And especially when the joke is a, what I think you call them dad jokes. Yeah. Dad jokes are the ones which are supposedly safe. They're not going to offend anybody. Hmm. Um, and they give you that oh, kind of sensation. Oh. But, but that oh, sensation that you know that somebody else is having at the same time with you is quite comforting. Yeah, it's comforting. Because remember that we always laugh. Now, laughter is nothing. Well, laughter is connected to humor, but it's, it's, a, it's a different area if you like. But when you say laughter, you immediately think of the word humor, right? Humor and laughter are connected. Um, and uh, when, when somebody tells me a joke, I don't necessarily laugh. It doesn't mean to say that I, I didn't like the joke. Okay. Um, and that happens to all of us. Um, mm. But appreciating a joke, we laugh, we laugh together. We laugh with other people. Laugh is part of our comedy. It's, it's social. Imagine you walk into a room and everybody's laughing and you're not laughing. You immediately want to know what they're laughing about, don't you? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Because you want to laugh with them. Now, this is why. And, and also hope that it's not, they're not laughing at you. Now, that's a good point because there are a whole bunch of people, galatophobes, for example. Um, the galatophobes, and that comes from the Greek gelos, laughter. Um, nothing to do with ice cream, gelato. It's a g. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> I'll get my coat. Um, <laughs> Galatophobes, uh, th- th- they have a fear of laughing and they think people are laughing at them all the time. And oh, interesting. Uh, that's very interesting. There's a lot of research on this. And I would be very, very happy after to, to send you a bibliography on gal- galatophobia mm. because mm. there are certain places where there are more galatophobes than others. Oh, right. So, so, so across the world, yeah, it's it's not evenly distributed that, no. that condition. No, no, no. Obviously, it's it's a question of, of state and trait. Um, there are people in, in, everywhere. We don't want to get um, essentialist about this, but there are people everywhere uh, who who are, there, there may be a galatophobe uh, here in my town or anywhere. But um, research shows that there are certain countries where there are more galatophobes than others. And it's, 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 yeah, it's not a very nice condition. It's a psycho, you know, it's, it's, a, um, it's a neurodivergent con- uh, condition. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. And it's extremely important to be aware of that that exists, of course, uh, as well, then. This is Alistair Somerville. Congratulations on your 300th episode. I was glad to appear on episodes 105 and 175. In terms of a joke, rather than a dad joke, my family quite likes toddler jokes. So here's the one we like most. Why was the polar bear sad? 
because his name was Bench. Anyway, thanks a lot. Bye. I want to circle back to the dad jokes because what you said that there was that uh, they're not very offensive and they're corny and people just go ah and groan. But I don't think our listeners really appreciate and understand how much effort and time we put into selecting <laughs> jokes that work because sometimes we figure out, oh, it's your time to do the joke. And you go online, and you're trying to find a joke. And I hear James, no, I can't do that one. No, I can't do that one. Mm. And you realize, why, why, why do we keep feeling that we can't do certain jokes? <laughs> and that's and that's just when I say that we can't do that yeah. one. They're the ones that aren't marked as like over eighteen and censored because some of these places where you find the jokes, they they do mm. actually mask them, so you're not you can't even see them until you've clicked on something to reveal because they they've considered it to be so offensive that. Oh, it isn't allowed to be visible at first. Exactly. But those ones I don't even try. I mean, it's just, mm. but there's always, um, we always have to go through a, a filtering process, I guess, to to, to assess and judge a joke. Absolutely. Um, uh, absolutely. Um, I don't know whether you're going to have to edit this out, but um, there was a a website um, once upon a time called Wikipedia, And for, um, and this website only contained jokes that were t- that were taboo mm. and uh, I, as I was working on rape jokes at the time I needed I needed I needed some rape jokes and obviously it's the kind of joke that would be that would be um, censored on the internet because of the uh, algorithms and so on and so I looked up Wikipedia I couldn't find it but I found the book what they had done, they had um, downloaded, they had made a book out of it and it was available on Ab- Amazon. Um, I, I bought the book and then just it got to, it was a PDF file, basically a book. It wasn't a book. It was a PDF file full of jokes. Um, the, 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 the site is back. The site is back or it was back the last time I looked a couple of years ago during lockdown. Um, and what's interesting about it, about the site um, and, and, and the jokes, uh, are extremely shocking. I mean, I can understand. I can understand uh, why it was blocked out. What's interesting about the, the site are the hundreds of people that do like it and put likes because you know you're, you're able to uh, judge the joke. So what I'm trying to say is um, that these jokes that are being censored, we can censor all we like. Oh, they or whoever it is that censors all we like, but there are always going to be some people who are going to go for this kind of joke, and they're always going to be available somewhere, mm. um, and not even on the dark web, but on the um, surface of the web, such as Wikipedia. So, so what we say there is that the that humor humor always exists. It, it does. Just, it just sometimes finds a room. Mm. Well, it, yeah. Um, absolutely, um, a- absolutely, and again, um, again, the, the dark web. Um, I had a student looking at um, uh, alt right humor, and um, because you may, as you may know, that, um, the left, the left um, is kind of quite bad at humor, but the right is seems to be better at humor. So we decided to investigate this, and he went onto the dark web. Um, and downloaded stuff, which even shot me, and I thought I was pretty unshockable. Mm. Um, it was absolutely horrid. Um, so, mm. so yeah, it finds yeah, that's a good good metaphor, very good metaphor, James. Yeah, it finds a room, and and then remember that um, I was talking about disaster jokes at the beginning. Every single disaster, every single disaster um, is going to um, is is going to generate jokes. Uh, initially, uh, I don't know. Um, 9/11 is quite a, a recent one. Um, the the uh, yeah, it's the most recent one. Or, or the Queen dying it was not a disaster, but something very sad. Or Lady Diana, for example, Princess Diana. Immediately afterwards, uh, people used to start telling jokes, and you'd have these they're known as jo- joke cycles. Mm. Which, uh, if you take a joke cycle from the 1950s, we're not going to understand it today. But it becomes a coping mechanism then, really. It's So it's not only about laugh. Well, it is about laughing then, but it's the purpose of the joke becomes something different. I, I'm thinking now also uh, about um, the, the war in Ukraine and the tractors uh, pulling tanks, yes. uh, the memes about that. 
And so you're laughing about it at the same time as something extremely serious is going on. Yeah. Oh, yeah, but yeah. Uh, and uh, but, but again, what's really fascinating is that these jokes or memes or what they are, they are created by the people, for the people. Mm. <laughs> Unlike, say, satire, where you've got somebody, I know you've got um, some famous guy on TV or woman on TV doing satire that has been written by scriptwriters and prepared for her prepared for them it's extremely sophisticated hmm. yet at the other extreme you've got people young young people manipulating memes and making tractor me uh not, not tra what are they called tank memes with the hmm. z on and joking about the z or i don't know sort of brilliant one recently i thought it was absolutely brilliant and it was putin on a cracker and it said putin on the ritz yeah <laughs> <laughs> I love that one. And it, yeah, and that's a me. Yeah, I love yeah. it. It's so innocent. A, a yeah. Ritz cracker, and he's mm. on it, and he's cycling it, putting on the Ritz. It, it, yeah, I'm putting, yeah, I'm putting on the Ritz. Yeah, they're playing, it's playing the song as well. It's, yeah. it's clever. Um, it's actually quite innocent in, in, in a sense. I know that Putin's the bad guy, but um, it's also quite innocent. It's not even really punching down on, on him at all. It's about the, the, the pun. Mm -hmm. and, and the but but it's interesting then uh, what, you, what you're saying about the uh, jokes are dying and we have more memes yeah. but we also have this new technology popping up like uh, smart speakers and i know you mentioned before to us yeah. about children always asking the smart speakers tell me a joke yeah <laughs> so there, somebody's preparing jokes still yeah the smart speaker <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. uh, alexa um yeah children will tend to uh, in in mm -hmm. this research that we've study that we're carrying out the moment um children um will will say things like alexa please fart and alexa farts and and farting is something that makes children that makes adults <laughs> laugh as well for some reason farting is funny um and and yes uh, they will try and make the the the, the, the rather not so much a joke but they will certainly try and make the um the machine laugh and the machine ah, will okay. try. All right, so they're trying to. So rather than trying to get the machine to make them laugh, the the they're trying to make the machine laugh. Yeah, although they will okay. say you are right. They will say things like let make us laugh. They won't say tell us a joke, but they'll say things like make me laugh or say something ah, of funny or. Well, that's what we find. They they, they don't say tell us a mm. joke, but they'll say things like oh make us laugh, mm. Alexa. Um, I'm scared I'm saying Alexa is going to come on all over the house. <laughs> <laughs> There's people, people, speakers everywhere across the world are going to come on when they're listening to this episode. Yeah. yeah um, but which brings me back to walking into a pub and everybody's laughing. And we want to laugh uh, because we want to be part of that. And that, that what you just asked me about, the, the Alexa, the children. Again, the children have understood this. They know that if you laugh you're going to be in a group with people and we, that's what we want and it was interesting mm. when james said well um you might think they're laughing at you and that's really interesting uh because w we do think that even if you're not a galatophobe i think everybody's had the sensation maybe they're laughing at me maybe i said something wrong maybe i've I, I, you know, got something on my nose or something and at the same time this thing about laughing together it's what politicians have definitely honed in on yeah definitely definitely um i would start more or less with berlusconi he realized that if he was funny how, how can you not like somebody who makes you laugh Hi, this is Amy Buecher from episode 232. I was previously the vice president of behavior change design at MadPow, and now I'm the chief behavioral officer at Lirio. And I really enjoyed my conversation with James and Pear about behavioral design on UX podcast. And I'm so thrilled to celebrate your 300th episode. So here's my dad joke. What is the difference between snowmen and snow women? Snowballs. So I'm with a group of friends and someone tells a joke and I find it strictly not funny at all. Yeah. But the rest of the group of friends laugh and I feel like I should probably be laughing mm. to be still be part of the group. Yeah. Uh, so there's there's a lot of psychology going on there where I, I'm in a decision where I have to decide, 
do I continue with this? Do I speak up? What, what do I? Do? What's what's the policy here uh, for me to continue being a, a part of this group of friends? Maybe if it keeps going, I don't. It, there's there's so much that jokes do that they can actually exclude uh, rather than include as well. Absolutely. Now, if we look at internet, if we look at Twitter, for example, I'm sure I'm sure I'm not the only one to have had this sensation. Uh, you see people uh, in a thread. And they're obviously laughing at something and you're trying to work out what the hell they're laughing at. And mm. You, mm. You, you don't get it. I don't get it. Why don't mm. you get it? It's because it's, it's, it's a group and they're talking to each other. And you're not yeah. part also of it's that tr- It's tribal. It's tribal, absolutely. It's yeah. tribal. Yeah. It's totally tribal. And going back to the alt-right, um, yeah. there are so many different um, verbal and also multimodal signals that they send out to each other. So that you know <laughs> that that communication is aimed at other people in that group. I know Peppa Pig. That's a very basic one. That's an easy one. But mm. there are others, um, emojis, uh, which 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 connote the group. But the moment you're using an emoji, or the moment you're using I know, Peppa Pig or a cartoon character, you're in the realm of comicity, aren't you? I, I would argue, mm. um, you know, why why do a cartoon when you could have uh, you could have put in a, a photograph? But the minute you uh, stylize something in that way, you're entering a different realm of comic discourse or humorous discourse, or yeah. or rather, I'm um, pretending that I'm only joking, but I'm saying something serious. So this all feels like uh, an absolute minefield so, it is. because I know that <laughs> we talk about a lot about tonality on websites and and sometimes we talk well we should put in humor into our websites to make them more personal to make them more attractive because then we people understand that we are a fun group of people but adding humor of course then means that you will be you will necessarily be excluding people should we be using humor more or should be we be more wary how, how should we cope with this how do we decide when and when to and when not to use humor in our, our digital interfaces as well. Oh my goodness! Um, I haven't, I've never, I've not really thought about this, but it seems to me that it's, it's as though humour is the default position on social media for some reason. There's a study uh, carried out in Jerusalem, um, and they found that they they were looking at what people were using the web to do, and they were they found the low cats were very high up in cats. Uh, for some reason, cats were everywhere. Uh, at the time, there were the low cats as well. The low cats, which were the first memes, if you probably remember, um, about 10 years ago or so. And um, obviously porn, obviously. But then after the low cats and the porn, and you could argue that low cats are funny, or that low cats are funny, what was the humour? such a huge amount of humour on the internet. Um, so it shouldn't surprise us that politics and Ukrainians and whoever are using humour, um, because humour brings us together. It's, it's it's obviously a cognitive process, but it's also a social pro. pro uh, it's something social, and it's also something emo- emotional all in one. But it also becomes a a, a way uh, a get out of jail free card because people can say oh, can be really offensive and say, "But I was just joking." Exactly. Exactly. I was only joking. I didn't mean it. Absolutely. Mm. <laughs> but that's something you can do when we're having a conversation like this. Mm. But yeah, if you yeah, if you're true. trying to make your 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 brand or your your product your mm. digital product your app humorous, mm. your your app can't suddenly then just go, oh, we're only joking after they've they've after they've somehow sensed that that joke didn't go down well. No, I'm <laughs> probably. Oh, mm. oh, oh, probably. I don't think. Yeah. I'm, mm. Maybe you could. Maybe there's an algorithm that can do that for you. Uh, oh, but, yeah. But uh, uh, sorry, it all but, depends on who your target group is. I yeah. Guess. And even talking about people from other countries. But I, I, I remember as a kid, it, it was, I mean, between Sweden and Norway, you always told jokes about Norwegians because you went, wanted to feel superior to our neighboring country because we were so much alike. So that so being that much alike is actually gave you an excuse for being able to tell these jokes. Yeah. And we we had the same thing in, in the UK. You had the, the Irishman, Englishman, Scotsman, Welshman. Yeah. You had all the, the, the regions or the countries mm. nearby that you would um, um, build into jokes. Well, yeah, there's, there is, there is an, uh, an underdog 
everybody's got an underdog, so... Uh, and it's offensive, and it's always offensive, I guess. Of course. Yeah, because by 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 its pure definition, it's 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 offences because you're you're making fun of another tribe. Absolutely. Hello, everyone. This is Ben Sauer. You may remember me from episodes ninety eight and two hundred seven. Here to deliver you a joke and make you groan all at the same time. A UX designer was visiting the local market one day, only to find that, unbeknownst to them. Their mother had picked luscious fruit from the designer's garden and was unashamedly selling it as though it was her own. The designer loudly exclaimed, Why are you selling my fig, Ma? So is there anything uh, like universal humour? Is there anything that everybody finds funny? Well, there should be. Um, but, but that's that there should be. Within universal humour, the underdog is something that everybody should find funny is recognized as a trope. So the underdog, definitely. Um, although you're going to change the underdog, if you see what I mean, wherever you go. Yeah. Uh, right. So the underdog is one of them. Um, another one is sex, of course. Um, we all laugh at mm. sex, right. um, <laughs> but in different ways. So the... S- and, and, f- and farts, like you and said. Farts. I mean, that's, but, that's but again, globally the funny thing. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I don't want to get out of... Uh, I, I, I'm saying I'm not sure here. I'm raising my hands as I say this. I believe farts are not funny in Japan. I mean, if somebody Japanese is listening, they might be able to correct me. Um, because I don't think they find poop funny, whereas um, poop is funny um, in many cultures, but not... Well, it's not always funny. <laughs> but... Um, it, it, it is, um, but in many cultures. Um, but I believe not in Japan because the the, the um, what's it called the emoticon the emoji you know the one the laugh what's it called the poop emoji do you know the one now that was invented in Japan and it wasn't meant to be Ugh. you know it's meant to be so so I think it wasn't meant to be funny or yucky in any way so um, I'm careful what I say about uh, shit in Japan but the other thing about poop. And the other thing um, is that how we have transferred the concept of excreta onto our politicians. So um, if you look at cartoons, uh, recent cartoons, you'll find people like Donald Trump in a diaper, in a dirty Mm. diaper. Um, I'm thinking of Martin Rosen. Uh, He will um, often depict the UK the English Channel um, with floating turds. Um, it sounds really serious, but it's it, it's very dark humour. Well, obviously, it's brown humour. I I wrote an article on this club. I called it brown humour. Um, but we're transferring um, uh, poop, the concept of, of shit, onto our politicians and parties. Right, but trying to do it in a clever way. Obviously, always. yeah. Yeah. In, in, in a clever way, of course, yes, absolutely. Mm. Um, there was, uh, I don't know, uh, what's his name in the UK, Guardian, Steve Bell. He would always depict Trump with a golden lavatory seat on his head in place of his hair. Mm. And Nigel oh. Farage, yeah. again, I think, I'm trying to think, I think it's Steve Bell again, would always have uh, Farage... Um, being excreted from uh, Mr. Trump's derriere in his cartoons. So I can hear my listeners or our listeners going several times along the show. Well, but that's not humor. That's not funny. That's not a joke. Uh, but by definition, you're saying it is a joke yes, <laughs> because that's what you do. Research it, I mean, whether you find yeah. it funny or not is, mm. is different. Yeah. You might not find it mm. funny, but that does not de- de- delegitimize the humor in that cartoon. You recognize yeah. that as an attempt yeah. to amuse. It's going to be very offensive to Mr. Mr. Tr- uh, Trump and Mr. Farage. And it's going to be offensive to conservatives and um, Republicans. So I understand that. But that doesn't mean you can de- delegitimize it as a joke any more than I can delegitimize the way when the Capitol was taken on January 6th last year. That I, that I, that the, the guy who put on, um, that looked like, um, big chief, I don't know who, um, an Indian chief, uh, Amerindian chief, um, there was no way that I could take him seriously. I mean, he was, he was being, he was in, in his own way, 
he was being trying to be funny. Whether I find it funny or not depends on a whole bunch of variables in my psyche. But that mm. doesn't that doesn't mean to say that he wasn't trying to be funny. Of course, he was trying to be funny. Mm. In a kind of a less <laughs> way, of course, because the taking of the capital was, you know. Um, it becomes surreal. It was surreal. The humor in that but it was also yeah. the, the classic Bactinian carnival. It was that the people are becoming or trying to 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 take control, and that what that's what happens in the carnival. You, you know, you put a donkey in your head, on a donkey's head on, you know, and the, the the jester becomes the king for a day, and that was what was happening here. And when I saw the guy with the feathers on, I thought this is the carnival. And obviously, it was something very serious going on. I didn't, I personally didn't find it funny, but I recognised the carnival in that. So it's not a question of whether you find it funny or not. It's still a joke. You can't delegitimize it because you don't like it. Hey, UX Podcast. It's Chris Nassel from episodes 25, 86, 121, 136, 216, 217, and 276. The dad joke I'd like to contribute goes like this. What does a couch say? Mooch. That one's homegrown. Congratulations on your 300th episode. You've spent many, many years researching and, 40, and you've I'm mentioned so old, yeah. <laughs> 40 years researching. And, and you mentioned at the beginning of, the, of our chat um, your uh, research into, into rape jokes, which, um, it, which must have been, uh, yeah, must have been um, really tough to go through. Yep. So, how, how, how do you find anything funny anymore? I mean, do you do you become completely <laughs> devoid? I, I, I just found that question funny. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so I find I've had, funny. Yeah, you've answered it by laughing. Of course, I, question. I, I don't find. I, I I'm appalled by rape, rape jokes, mm -hmm. but I recognise the fact the fact that they exist means that there are people that find them funny. Mm. So um, it's kind of Sisyphean, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, they're there. Um, and um, in our research, we found that uh, people, some people found them funny, and yet they'd cover their mouths. So they knew that they shouldn't be finding them funny. Yeah, they're, up, they're, they're basically their upbringing. Uh, society taught them that you shouldn't laugh at certain things, but um, they, they were laughing in any way, just signaling that they knew it was wrong. Honestly, I think we could go on for hours talking about this. The more we talk, the more I realize I want to explore different pathways uh, around humor. And I hope our listeners are excited to learn more about this and be more careful, but also be more brave in trying things out and learning what, how people react to different things. And, and it's always about exploring and experimenting, of course, in our industry. So, and exploring your, your research as well, that would be fantastic. Uh, and really, really, I hope we get to bring you on the show again in the future. Oh, I'd love to. I mean, it's, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm kind of feel apologetic because it's been so serious. I was expecting <laughs> to be laughing all the way through it. And I got very serious. That's my fault. But I think it's because humor is serious. Yeah, because it, it, humor feels so innocent, but then you realize it's so, so powerful. Absolutely. And that's the thing you Absolutely. need to realize. Absolutely. But yeah. do remember, mm. but do mm. remember, humor is a thermometer rather than a thermostat. It takes the temperature of a society rather than changes a society. Thank you so much, Delia. Thank you very much for having me. I've been thinking oh, a fair bit um, this last couple of days since we talked um, to Delia that, um, about inclusive design and what that means um, to us as, as digital designers um, and what that means in connection to humour mm. and jokes. And I've been, to be honest, I've actually been struggling to to come to terms with the, the of any design situation where we can be fully inclusive while being humorous. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, because we covered so much uh, area around how how it's risky, how they can be offensive, how they can cause disparagement. There are culture clashes, uh, which means that neurodiversity. There are so many sensitive areas where things can go wrong, which means that if you're going to do it, if you're going to use humor, it needs to be in an environment where you have trust and you know who you're talking to and they uh, already have confidence that you 
are who you say you are and you, you have these values and they understand your values so that the joke perhaps has a strong foundation. Uh, depending on, of course, on the, I'm, I'm thinking sometimes, are there are there word puns that always work? I'm not sure. Uh, well, I mean, we, we, we kind of go into that a little bit about universal mm. humor. I mean, it's, we're we're coming from a from an English speaking mm. perspective, Poe. I mean, is there can we really say that this joke in English is going to be universally understood and universally yeah. universally accepted? absolutely not no um, mm. not because we're presuming a certain you know, understanding mm. of English um, we can oh, no I, th I think it's it's difficult I think I think it's almost a bit ups no, a bit sad that I've come to the conclusion that to be fully inclusive in design you can't use any humor in your design well um, unless the humor perhaps is at your own expense uh, about yourself uh, inwards uh, or if if you use the help of your community of your users stakeholders if you use their their own words and allow them to be the humorous ones uh, empowering them to be uh, the owners of that humor then perhaps that would work as well but it's really really difficult to 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 know ahead of time or understand where people are coming from to feel confident enough to use humor that will have the impact that you want it to have yeah like you mentioned about i mean it's 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 trust but also um, it's relationship building you've got to have you've got to have climbed into the room together yeah um because then you're in a shared space with shared experience and you both yeah. feel safe yeah and you both feel safe with a certain type mm. of humor or you're confident that a certain type of humor will work um so I mean, on your on your public facing you know web page or app then that is mm. risky then because you're you know whenever your whenever your shop front is facing out to the the world the public at large you you're gonna have oh you're gonna be taking a bit of a risk with humor right and even if you do it like in a in a closed space uh, in this day and age of the internet, I mean, you, you 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 don't know how it will be taken out of context, anyway. So it's I mean, wherever you say it, wherever you tell a joke, it might be used for nefarious purposes to to twist and turn your words in other uh, ways. So I mean, it's it's a it's a difficult thing to to actually <laughs> cope with. And I'm realizing, uh, as you as you were saying, I mean, isn't that a bit sad that that humor is so difficult? There should be an easier answer. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what, Papa? When you said, um, "Do it mm -hmm. in a close," I heard you space, laughing. Yeah, I started. Mm. I started thinking about fart jokes. <laughs> yeah, that, we touched upon that, didn't we? That <laughs> the, the kids ask the the devices to fart. I mean, that's yeah, maybe. So, mm. so maybe that's it. I mean, you know, you're safe so long mm. as you keep your your digital humor to. Fart related jokes. I'm pretty sure a lot of people would abandon websites that do fart jokes. I mean, yes, <laughs> that's not that's roughly, not your yeah, that's, that's not funny. your go to solution. I would not say. <laughs> yeah. Click this button. Click this button. Oh, like, do you remember the um the thing where you was it pull my finger? Ah, uh, so familiar. But I can't, did I, you have I, that when you were... I can't remember what what it was. I I remember doing it, but I can't remember what it was. Oh, it's mm. one of those school child things where you kind of, someone would, you'd put your finger and you say, pull my finger, pull my finger. And someone would pull your finger and you'd fart. Ah, okay. Mm. Proper school of kid course. stuff. Well, so press my button, press my button. Mm. So then your website, you press the button and it would mm. make, oh, I don't know. No, you're, no humor doesn't work. But, does it? but it's interesting <laughs> because, I mean, throughout history, uh, if you are a public speaker, you, you'd sometimes read advice on public speaking and, and they would say, Start off with a joke to build trust and rapport and relationships and appeal. But I can see it uh, starting off with a joke working in the entirely opposite direction, meaning that people will stop listening if, if they don't like your joke. Hmm. Well, I mean, that's, that's, I can understand that advice. Looping back again to what we're saying about um, um, oh, um, mm -hmm. having a relationship or knowing the audience to a degree, that if, when you do a talk pack, you're going to be giving it to um, a group of people where you know you have um, information about certain mm. attributes of that group. They are because of your talk yourself. You might be designers, or they you know they they may come. You know it's an international conference, or you know it's a conference in in Germany, or you know you, there are parameters that you do um, have you know with you when you go into that. Mm. 
and same as they do know something. So you've got you've got shared information and a shared space, which means certain jokes will right. work. Yeah, actually, recently but I did a talk for for programmers, and I was able to work in jokes about people having the surname Null, uh, because in in programming, using the the word Null means that it's an empty string. It, I mean, this doesn't make sense to you at all if you don't understand programming, but. <laughs> For them, of course, it worked, and then I could go on to build on that story and the actual the actual dangers and risks of having that surname, surname and what it means for for public facing services uh, and the problems that they these people actually have <laughs> in real life. So it, it means taking something funny and then also using that to prove a point. So you're actually building on top of the joke, which is an interesting concept as well. Yeah. 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 You take a situation that well it seems hilarious yeah. that you would make that kind of mistake and cause that kind of problem but then it's not humorous necessarily for all the people who are exactly and i i am attentive and uh, conscious of that and explain it to the audience as well after the joke <laughs> i hope there was some humor in this show i think there was i mean i would love for people to reflect on this i mean th there are so many questions in my head around humor and the, the how i feel now almost more uh aware of maybe i should avoid humor and at the same time, as I don't really want to avoid it. And it's it's difficult. It's really difficult. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, it's uh, like I said, I f you feel a bit sad that you come to a conclusion that humor is mm. dangerous. But, you know, what are we without humor? Exactly. It's it's just, yeah, <laughs> so perplexing. That, that yeah. Fascinating balance between, yeah, fascinating balance between um, being sufficiently inclusive, but also sufficiently human, mm. I guess. Because... Oh, as we've learned, the human, you know, humans bond mm. through humor. I mean, I, w I wouldn't mind this. I think this would be a fun thing. I wouldn't mind our listeners sending us jokes, uh, some of their favorite jokes. And I would, I, mean, I, I love hearing jokes and I won't t take offense. And I, I'm just interested in what people find funny. I would, about like now when we've reached 300 episodes, um, to thank a few of the people that actually make this happen mm -hmm. apart from me and you um one in particular of course is remy yeah who uh, does all the editing of the shows and um, we've come to the point where we actually just send off files and say put something together for us thank you <laughs> and it works <laughs> he's yeah he's, he's he's listened to a lot of shows now of course doing the production so he yeah he's the one that makes um the decisions when it comes to some of the details of what gets in and what doesn't hello everyone in the ux podcast community this is remy from the editing room i have had the honor and privilege to edit this podcast uh, since 2014 it's been crazy so many years so many episodes and now we are here episode 300 fantastic people ask me what my job as an editor is like well to uh cut a long story short yeah that was that was the joke the story cutting part Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. Keep on doing that. It keeps us all alive. Goodbye. And then we have um, teams of volunteers, which you'll have heard us asking for more volunteers of, over the um, the last few years. Um, and um, one of those volunteers um, is Mike White, who does help almost every episode with publishing the transcript. Um, and he's actually contributing one of the jokes that's coming up in, or has is included yeah. in this episode. It's amazing. Remember to keep moving. See you on the other side. You've said this is apparently the, according to research, the funniest joke ever. Acor yeah. Uh, yeah, according to research done in early 2000s. Okay. Two hunters are out in the woods when one of them collapses. He's not breathing and his eyes are glazed. So his friend calls 911. My friend is dead. What should I do? The operator replies, Calm down, sir. I can help. First, make sure that he's dead. There's a silence, then a loud bang. Back on the phone, the guy says, 
Okay, now what?